Welcome to In and Around War, a podcast of the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights on contemporary issues related to wars. Episode 3 explores the work of non-governmental organizations in war and the challenges they face with Geneva Academy alumnus Ilya Nuzov. Hello everyone, welcome to episode 3 of the Geneva Academy podcast in and around wars. I am Antonio Coco, a former student and teaching assistant of the Geneva Academy, and I now teach international law at the University of Essex. Welcome to our listeners also from my side. My name is Anna Strovin Corali, and I'm a teaching assistant at the Geneva Academy and a PhD student at the Geneva Graduate Institute. In today's episode, we have the immense pleasure of hosting Ilya Nusov, who is like myself, an alumnus and a former teaching assistant at the Geneva Academy. Ilya, who is my friend, is also the head of Eastern Europe and Central Asia desk at the International Federation for Human Rights, also known with the acronym FIDH. Thank you, Ilya, for accepting our invitation and for being here with us. Thank you, Antonio and Anna. It's a pleasure to be here. We wish to begin this podcast by first asking you, what is actually that the International Federation for Human Rights does, and what is your role specifically between this organization? Before I answer your question, I'd like to start with a little disclaimer, namely that what I say here today represents my own views and doesn't necessarily represent the views of my organization, the International Federation for Human Rights, which is a Paris-based non-governmental organization with offices in The Hague, Brussels, Geneva, and among other places. And it federates 192 non-governmental organizations around the world. These are our member organizations. And in fact, our executive structures are comprised of representatives of these member organizations. So we have quite an unusual structure in that it's a non-governmental organization that is effectively governed by its members. And the International Federation for Human Rights has a quite a broad mandate. We are charged with advancing all of the rights that are embodied in the Universal Declaration for Human Rights. And I think it will be fair to say that our activities fall into four general categories of work that non-governmental organizations do, namely research, litigation, advocacy, and awareness-raising activities. My role specifically is as the head of Eastern Europe and Central Asia Desk. I coordinate the work of member organizations in my region, which comprises the 12 countries of the former Soviet Union minus the Baltic states. In this region, we currently have 16 member organizations. So all of the work that we do is based on the needs and demands of our member organizations. If they identify certain violations of human rights or international humanitarian law, they bring to our attention and they would like to take certain actions to address those violations. That's where we step in and provide our expertise or we help them lead their uh, advocacy activities or documentation activities, research and so forth. So my work revolves around management, but it also entails the provision of expertise in international law to help our member organizations to advance their work. Ilya, our podcast is called In and Around Wars, and we all know that war is a terrible thing. How does war pose a challenge to the work of your organization and perhaps non-governmental organizations in general? War brings a lot of human suffering and a lot of violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. And hence, the need to document those violations is also amplified during the time of armed conflict. So with war, there is an increase in demand for activities of non-governmental organizations. But it also brings a lot of challenges. So the access to evidence, for instance, of violations of international humanitarian law due to the security situation and on the ground, which sometimes impedes access to, to physical evidence to victims or witnesses who have fled or who are still trapped in the conflict zone who are not able to speak with. There are also challenges in terms of sometimes oversaturation, what I would call, of the stakeholders or organizations that are involved in working in certain conflicts. And we see that, for example, with respect to Ukraine, which is on the one hand good because sometimes armed conflict 
generates so much response that no stone is left unturned, so to speak, and victims have a better opportunity to have violations addressed and justice further. But on the other hand, it brings this overwhelming response from the international community that in a way causes an overflow of players who want to work in a certain context. And sometimes that complicates our work as there are victims who are re-traumatized because they have been interviewed more than once by different organizations. There is not an adequate methodology that is being employed by certain organizations who sometimes lack a capacity to lead certain work. And there's a lack of coordination between the different organizations that are working on a particular context. So just off the top of my head, these are some of the primary challenges that we're grappling with currently with respect to our work in Ukraine. And does your organization provide such coordination to an extent? Or does it suffer from the need to having to coordinate with other organizations? Our organization tries to provide that type of coordination, at least with respect to our member organizations. So in Ukraine, we currently have one member organization with another organization that will join the Federation in October. Our member organization in Ukraine is called for the Center for Civil Liberties. And another organization that will be joining is called the Kharkov Human Rights Protection Group. And these two organizations are part of two coalitions that have formed to further accountability for international crimes in Ukraine. One is called the 5 a.m. coalition and the other is called the Tribunal for Putin coalition. And two of these coalitions comprise over 20 local non-governmental organizations, perhaps even more. And so you can imagine the challenge of having to coordinate the activities of all these organizations. This is not to say that my organization has stepped in and done that. We have decided to focus our efforts on two thematics that we have had prior experience and that we are able to pursue due to our federated status, namely the work involving sexual and gender-based violence and forced transfer of civilian from Ukraine to Russia. With respect to sexual and gender-based violence, we have done work in the past in other contexts, so we've decided to leverage our experience in that field to pursue that type of work. And with respect to forced transfer of civilians, we thought that since we're a federation, we have member organizations in Russia, we're well-placed to glean evidence with respect to those types of violations from Ukraine and from Russia and other places where people who have been forcibly transferred might end up. So we try to coordinate activities, at least with respect to two of those thematics between organizations that work in this field. And it's quite challenging because there's quite a lot of work to do in the preliminary sort of mapping of all the actors that are working in Ukraine. And as I've alluded to before, there are quite many international non-governmental organizations who are involved in this work. And it's taken us quite a lot of time to actually identify who is doing what and how not to duplicate our efforts and coordinate our work better. Ilya, so you mentioned already quite some activities that are carried out by the International Federation for Human Rights. And one of the things that you referred to was that you also interview victims. So my next question is with regard to the commentation, basically, of atrocities, of serious violations of human rights. I understand that one of the things that you do is that you actually also go to the so-called crime scene and try to collect evidence on different violations from abroad. So not only from the offices, but I would like to understand more generally what else you do with regard to the documentation. Documentation generally entails the gathering of evidence by several means. You've mentioned interviewing. Yes, that is correct. We interview victims and witnesses by going directly to the ground or reaching out to them via telephone or Zoom or what have you. Sometimes we use what's called open source intelligence to gather evidence. This is now an emerging field and very promising one because it offers the opportunity for researchers to gather important evidence without leaving their offices, which could then be used in courts to locate the scene of the potential crime and even sometimes identify potential perpetrators. My organization doesn't have the capacity or expertise to go directly to the crime scene to gather evidence of crimes such as bullet casings and fragments of explosive devices. Some organizations like Amnesty International have a specialized unit that do that. That's not something that we do. Our documentation entails mostly interviews, open source research, 
and first using reports of our documentation done by our member organizations and what's available in open sources uh, that's been documented by journalists and other non-governmental, international non-governmental organizations or international organizations like the United Nations, the Organization for Security and Cooperation for Europe and so forth. And you mentioned digital evidence and open source intelligence. So do you encourage your member organizations perhaps to campaign with the population, for example, download apps like Eyewitness that allow the documentation of atrocities in a manner that could comply with standards then required to constitute evidence? And in general, what is your approach to this digital evidence emerging new world? We haven't encouraged our member organizations yet to download apps such as Eyewitness, but I think that's a great idea, Antonio, and I think maybe that's something that we will encourage going further. In general, my organization is more conservative in respect of documentation in that we do rely on these traditional methods of evidence gathering, such as interviewing. But Invariably, we all, to, to a certain extent, use open source intelligence, although it's not as advanced as such outfits like Bellingcat. We're not able to precisely geolocate the crime scene or conduct these very elaborate investigations into the dark web records of the movements of officers of the Russian power structures, for instance, Bellingcat does. But we do sometimes conduct investigations into social media websites, such as in Russia, there's a website called Vkontakti or Facebook or all of the other ones in order to sometimes establish links between the perpetrator and a certain armed unit or armed group, such as the Wagner Mercenaries. You've probably heard of this outfit. We recently brought complaint in the Russian courts against members of Wagner Group who have committed crimes in Syria. And in that particular case, we've used open source intelligence to ascertain that Wagner Group had operated in Syria at a certain moment in time and that certain members or Russian nationals belonged to what Wagner Group or were members of the Wagner Group at that time. And we were able to also draw on the work of journalists who helped us to identify one of the potential perpetrators of those crimes. I don't believe we have a specific policy on the use of open source intelligence at this moment yet, but this is something that we're definitely thinking about for the future. And we see that as an emerging field that really warrants the attention of all non-governmental organizations that work on furthering accountability. So, Ilya, you referred to the case that the International Federation for Human Rights brought together with two other organizations against Russia on behalf of Syrian victims before the European Court of Human Rights. Now, this complaint relates to the Russia dismissal of a criminal investigation against a member of the Wagner Group which functions in various parts around the world, so not only in Ukraine, but It has also been active in, for instance, in Mali, Libya, Syria, and so on. Now, what we wonder is, what were the legal grounds that your organizations used to bring the case before the European Court of Human Rights, knowing that the Russia is no longer a party to the European Convention on Human Rights? Well, I'd like to start off by reminding our listeners that Russia was party to the European Convention on Human Rights all the way through September 16 of this year. It's only after 16 of September that it officially ceased to be a member of the Council of Europe and hence of the European Convention on Human Rights, even though Russia has already in March, I believe, declared that it will not be carrying out or implementing the decision of the European Court of Human Rights. So to the extent that we would get a favorable judgment from the European Court of Human Rights, I think it would be symbolic but it would also help expose the links between Europe and between Russian Federation and the Wagner Group, which up until this point, at least, were very much hidden by the authorities. With the conflict in Ukraine, those links became better exposed. And now there's very little doubt that Russia bears responsibility for the violations of international human rights law or international humanitarian law that Wagner commits around the world. So the theory of the case was quite novel because we brought a complaint alleging violations of both Articles 2 and 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the prohibition of torture and prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of life, the right to life, based on the fact that Wagner acted as Russia's agent 
acting extraterritorially, and in doing so, it deprived somebody of their life and tortured an individual, hence triggering Russia's obligation. Now, the, the reason why this case is novel is because, as you well know, jurisdiction of a state is, for the purpose of the European Convention on Human Rights, is mostly territorial, with some exceptions where the state might exercise effective control over territory or over a person. So that's one issue, preliminary issue we have to overcome. And the other being that the conduct could only be attributable to the state if it's acting through its agents. So we had to prove that Wagner was acting as agents of the Russian state, even though they're not formally part of the armed forces of Russian Federation. So there again, we had to show that Wagner Group acts under the effective control of the Russian Federation. Our second theory of the case uh, on the basis of which we brought the complaint to the European Court of Human Rights, is that Russia violated its positive obligations with respect to both the right to be free from torture and a violation of the right to life. Namely, that the state had a duty to investigate violations committed allegedly by its own nationals, and it failed to discharge that obligation to conduct an effective investigation and to bring the perpetrators to account. And because Russia has what's called an act of nationality, ju criminal jurisdiction, meaning that it has an obligation to investigate crimes committed by its own nationals abroad in the case where no investigation has been opened on the territory of the state where the crime has been committed, Russia, we claimed, breached this obligation because after we repeatedly asked the investigative committee to do so, it failed to open a criminal investigation into the alleged acts of torture and murder of the Syrian national committed by Russian nationals and therefore failed to discharge its, its, ob its positive obligations to investigate cases of torture and murder and punish the perpetrators. So, of course, this is one complaint that you filed first in Russian courts and then to the European Court of Human Rights. But do you engage frequently in litigation activities? And if so, how does this work? Is it mostly the member organizations or is it directly the federation that engages in them? I would say both. Mostly it's joint efforts between our member organizations and the secretariat. We have what's called a litigation action group headed by a very talented lawyer, Clemence Bechtart, which is based in Paris. But this particular section of our organization deals almost exclusively with cases of universal jurisdiction and some cases that the example of which I just brought to you now, which is not a case of universal jurisdiction in the strictest sense, but it's still a criminal case which we brought in a jurisdiction other than where the crime actually took place. And usually the way it happens is a member organization brings a particular case to our attention or will say that a victim of a crime has addressed the organization asking it to help bring a case to court. Or we will learn that a perpetrator of a certain crime has found his or her way into a European soil or into a jurisdiction where a prosecution on the basis of universal jurisdiction is possible. So there are different ways of bringing a case to our attention where we then undertake to prosecute that case with the help of our member organizations who usually represent victims directly. Just to go back to that example of the Syria case, we have been contacted by the brother of the victim who recognized his brother in the video that was circulated in the social media in 2017, where we saw the gruesome acts of torture and then the murder of his own sibling. And he contacted our member organization, which works on Syria, but is based in Paris, which then in turn contacted the litigation action group and the representative of the litigation action group turned to me and asked if I would reach out to our member organization in Russia which would then facilitate the filing of the complaint there. So you see how this was a, a tripartite arrangement, and it's not something that could be replicated on every case, but we almost always collaborate with our member organizations in bringing complaints to any criminal jurisdiction. 
We all agree that courts are only an ex post facto solution to different human rights violations and atrocity committed in the war. Now, many would also agree that documentation litigation must be coupled with different action, which is taken by policymakers, particularly the governments and international organizations, to ease the pressure in the sense and pain that the war exert on people. And what I wonder, Ilya, is what is in your experience the relationship between non-governmental and international organizations in this sense? That is a very important relationship. And we often turn to international organizations because they are policymakers to try and somehow alleviate the suffering of the civilian populations from war, especially in light of the inadequate responses by the justice systems. You're right. It's always something that's lacking and you need additional tools to further accountability, justice and other mechanisms of dealing with atrocity. We shouldn't just focus on justice. There are also reparations and institutional reform and other mechanisms of addressing the legacies of uh, mass violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law that we collectively might refer to as transitional justice. With respect to international organizations, we often do a lot of lobbying to adopt certain policies and our recommendations after we do the documentation work. So one of the things that we've lobbied for recently was the establishment of a commission of inquiry on Ukraine, even though that doesn't bring justice directly to the perpetrators. It is also a way to ensure that the atrocities are well documented and evidence is preserved for future use in prosecutions. We would then lobby such institutions as the European Union to adopt sanctions, even though that's also not direct accountability, but we consider that as a way to address the responsibility of states and those individuals that are responsible for the atrocities that are being committed. We would also lobby for the adoption of resolutions that might undermine some of the ideological, if you will, foundations of some of these campaigns of violence. So, for instance, Russia has relied on history and misinterpretation of history around the Second World War as a way to justify its invasion of Ukraine. So we had lobbied for the adoption of a resolution on the European Union level to call out Russia on the whitewashing of Stalinist crimes. And the European Union has done that. It essentially equivocated the crimes of the Stalinist and Nazi regimes and kind of undermined that ideological pillar of Russia's violent attack against Ukraine. So we have heard that your organization, like many NGOs, works with victims and witnesses. It works with courts. It works with international organizations. So I'm wondering, what about the general public? Do you do any work in awareness raising campaigns, for example? Yes, indeed. That's a very important component of our work is to raise awareness as to the violations that are taking place, especially after there is an onset of what I would call informational fatigue. And we can see that with respect to the crisis in Ukraine, people just become overwhelmed with information. And also the international organizations and national authorities start paying less attention to the crisis. And we don't want that interest to wane because it is important to continue paying attention to what's happening to point out the violations that are occurring on a daily basis, which have not diminished, unfortunately, since the beginning of the full invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And so one of the things, for instance, we're doing with respect to the Ukraine war, we started video series called FIDH Explains, which analyzes the situation in Ukraine in light of international law. Now, it's a series of videos where we examine certain issues. Last week, for instance, we did attacks against critical infrastructure in Ukraine and whether that violates international humanitarian law or under what circumstances does that constitute a violation of international humanitarian law. In the first episode, we dispelled three myths surrounding the war in Ukraine, namely when the war started, whether you can qualify the war as a special military operation, and whether the claims by Russia that it was intervening to stop the genocide or to counter Ukraine's aggression, whether they held any truth as far as international law is concerned. I think it's very important to continuously highlight these issues and to make sure that the general public stays aware of what's happening in Ukraine and starts to influence 
its own governments to act. As we know, some of the states are not very much behind Ukraine, unfortunately, and Russia still manages to gain some traction. Some of the voting that takes place at the UN General Assembly level and even the UN Security Council level. So for us, it's important to continue to explain things to the general public in the uh, African states and uh, Asia using as many languages as possible so that everybody's aware of the truth. And this helps to also counter the massive propaganda campaign that Russia is launching to, again, justify its aggression and to make it seem as though the crimes that are being committed are e committed in equal part by Ukrainians and Ukraine's armed forces, which they're not. Ilya, before we conclude, it will be marvelous if you could share with us and with our listeners maybe an anecdote from your time at the Academy. So anything that you can think of that makes you laugh, makes you cry, makes you smile, anything that you remember from your time as a student at the Academy. Boy, there are so many very memorable episodes from my life as a student and as a teaching assistant from the academy that it's very hard to choose. So I will draw an example from the early days of my teaching at the Geneva Academy. As you know, the Geneva Academy is not only an institution of higher learning, it is also a place where important events take place and discussions made regarding important issues of international humanitarian law and broader international law. And I remember one such event took place around 2014, when the initiative for the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty were just taking hold. And there was a meeting involving the International Law Commission members to discuss a potential of establishing a treaty on crimes against humanity. And I was assigned by the then director of the Geneva Academy, Robert Roth, to take notes of this very important proceedings. And uh, during this meeting, I was sitting next to Sharif Bassiouni, you know, the renowned uh, scholar, a professor of international law who passed away recently, if I remember correctly. And during a break in this event, Sharif Bassiouni came right up to me and he said, Ilya, and I was already quite blown away by this development because, you know, this is Sharif Bassiouni. He came up right to me. He said my name. So I figured, no, this would be a prelude to a, an illuminating conversation on international law issues. Maybe I can ask him some pointers about the research I was currently doing. So during this pause, after he said, Ilya, all these thoughts are flashing through my mind. And then he says, do you know where the restroom is? <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you can imagine my disappointment, little pause, and uh, having already imagined all the elaborate international law subjects that I would discuss with the great Shuri Tassiwini. Nevertheless, it was still a very memorable experience, and I'll remember my days at the Academy quite fondly. Thank you for sharing this anecdote, Ilya, and thank you for sharing your knowledge and for illuminating us on the great work that you do and that your organization does in times of war, especially with respect to the conflict in Ukraine. I think many of our listeners will be enticed by knowing so much about what goes on to address the problems created by Russian invasion in Ukraine. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Let me remind all our listeners that they can listen to our podcast on all platforms where normally podcasts are listened to, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and so on and so forth. And additionally, you can also subscribe if you do not wish to miss any episode. Ciao, and we look forward to welcoming you again soon. You've been listening to In and Around Wars, a podcast of the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned for more inspiring conversations with Geneva Academy alumni. You can also check the Geneva Academy's website at www.geneva-academy.ch to find more resources and upcoming events on contemporary issues of international humanitarian law and policy.